Jack Curtis recalled the faults of the Newport 28 in this 1977 interview. And the Newport was a good flying airplane, but it was not a very good fighting airplane. It, it uh, had a nasty tendency to pull the fabric off the top wing if it dove it too fast. Several people did this, Ringbogger included, but he got down all right. The French had already decided they didn't want to use the Newport 28 because of its remarkable tendency to shed the fabric on its upper wing. The trouble is not when you're simply flying along, but if you try high speed or relatively high speed maneuvers, the air pressure then on the upper wing would cause it to shed. The Americans were so desperate for aircraft, they bought whatever the French could provide, and we brought quite a few Newport 28s, although eventually we were going to replace them with the SPAD 13, but at that time it was the only aircraft available. American airman James Meissner, seen here on the left with famous ace Eddie Rickenbacker, remarkably survived two wing failures caused by that faulty design. The Garber restoration team found the key to the failures when they took apart the wings. The leading edge of the ribs were merely tacked in place with small nails. Neither glue nor structural supports reinforced them. The design floor will remain firmly intact for historical reference when the Garber team puts the aircraft back together, painted in James Meissner's colors. First World War pilots had an expected lifespan of three to six weeks, and faulty aircraft design would contribute to those figures. Stress tests of the day consisted of shoveling sand onto the wings to see how much weight would break them off. Considering that these aircraft flew into combat, their structure was quite fragile. Light wood and wire covered in a fabric skin was coated in a highly flammable sealant called dope. This was the only protection from the elements. The gas tank, as you see here, is sitting above the pilot's legs. Uh, this is a very dangerous place for a gas tank to be, but for its day, this was the height of technology. Is there some way we could wedge that rag up in there? Leaky fuel connections still present a problem for the pilots of old Rhinebeck Aerodrome. Is it leaking or just that's where it's vibrating? It's got a little drip, but I don't mind wedging the cowls up there to stop the vibration a little bit. I just pushed the tank forward. Eventually, the crew gets the Sopwith Camel airborne. But pilot Gene DeMarco is understandably concerned. The reason he keeps looking into the cockpit is because fuel is leaking all over his legs. Brian Coughlin also faces real terror in the skies. Look to the lower right-hand side of the screen, below the machine gun. The gun has caught fire in a demonstration flight of this German Fokker triplane. After a few tense moments, Kotlin is able to extinguish the flame, and in a landing itself somewhat dramatic, manages to get the airplane back on the ground. Airplanes of that period did catch fire not only from the various uh, actions in combat, but just actually everyday flying due to the materials and the way things were constructed that they would actually break apart or split, or leak, and then catch fire for one, one reason or another. But it was evident early on that the aeroplane's potential as a military tool would far outweigh its dangers. A concept Wilbur Wright championed in 1909 as he hauled his flying machine from one demonstration to another all over Europe. In these first films ever taken from an aircraft, a flight for Italian officials, 
the reconnaissance potential was obvious. In 1916, one group of American pilots volunteered its services to fight for the French in its own air squadron, or escadrille, a full year before America declared war on Germany. Its members took the name Lafayette Escadrille, after a French aristocrat who'd fought with the US in the Revolutionary War. They were a strange and idealistic breed who fought above the battlefields for a lofty cause in an adopted country. They are the elite of the elite, the creme de la creme. Harvard men, Yale men, University of Virginia men, who have decided that it's important enough to sacrifice their lives to protect liberty by protecting France. And what better advertisement for uh, an America that for many of these young men, uh, to them was actually, if not cowardly, at least laggard in getting into this war to end all wars. Kiffin Rockwell, a medical student from North Carolina. William Thor, ex-foreign legionnaire with a damaged knee, poor vision and feeble hearing. Victor Chapman, the well-to-do architecture student from New York State, great-great-grandson to John Jay, who signed the Declaration of Independence. In the coming battles, the Lafayette Escadrille would prove to be welcome reinforcements to the French who in two years of bloody war had over two million casualties. The main function of aircraft in the First World War was reconnaissance. Airmen prying behind enemy lines robbed ground troops of the element of surprise and changed the way war was fought forever. They were also concerted attempts to use aircraft to bomb the enemy. Attacks on supplies and infrastructure like railroads and bridges were quite successful. The bombing of cities, however, was less significant, and the psychological effects far outweighed actual physical damage. British pilots demoralized enemy ground troops with strafing runs on German trenches. The most memorable aircraft of World War I was to be the fighter, at first, slow-moving observation planes carried weapons. Then, from the autumn of 1915 to spring 1916, German pilots used armed aircraft more deliberately to attack French and British observation planes in a period that became known as the Fokker Scourge. The key to their success was the replacement of handguns with a new device which allowed them to fire machine guns forward through the propeller arc of their single-wing Fokker Eindeckers. The aircraft was evolving from the purely defensive, where crews protected themselves with a movable machine gun in the rear cockpit, to a truly offensive weapon of war. With the development of the true fighter plane, the machine gun becomes part of the aircraft. Le 23 septembre 1900... Ironically, it was the dramatic success of a well-known French airman, Roland Garrow, that gave the Germans the idea that machine guns could be fired through their propeller arc. On his aircraft, Garrow had attached metal plates that deflected bullets off his blades. He was able to achieve a number of victories in April of 1915, and when he then crash-landed behind German lines, uh, I believe his engine failed, uh, the Germans then quickly picked up on this technology, improved on it, and the war took an entirely new, uh, a new dimension. And this dimension is this war, this struggle for control of the air. Rather than deflecting bullets off the propeller, the German system, developed by Fokker, synchronized the propeller and machine gun. The Allies didn't develop a successful version of this gun until later in the war. When the propeller comes around, it gets about here, this mechanism interrupts the firing mechanism, so it won't fire until the blade gets to about this position. And it keeps rolling around, and when the other blade comes up, once again it stops, stops and starts firing again when you get to the other side, and this continues. You're interrupting the firing sequence, at every half a rotation of the propeller. 
This new device was so effective that Germany seized air superiority with only about three dozen Fokker aircraft kitted out with synchronized machine guns. British airmen grimly referred to themselves as Fokker fodder.